Okay, uh, it's now time for our uh, first keynote speaker, uh, Dwight Merriam. Um, I will say that uh, we will finish here at uh, 10.30 and uh, adjourn to the uh, coffee lounge once again. Please pick up your jackets because this room is not secure uh, after uh, this morning. So, um, Dwight Merriam is a good friend of mine. Uh, he is a lawyer in uh, Hartford, Connecticut. I'll give you the, uh, the background so you can evaluate uh, him and <clears throat> his, his talk. He's a graduate with honors uh, from the University of Massachusetts in 1968 and then took nine years off to serve in the U.S. Navy. Um, he is a captain, uh, now retired. Uh, he made three tours of Vietnam and uh, he's uh, uh, then got his Master of Urban Planning at the University of North Carolina at Ch uh, Chapel Hill in 1975 and uh, got his law degree, his JD, from Yale in 1978. He's been with Robinson and Cole since uh, he graduated from law school, in fact, and even before he graduated from law school. He's the founder and the, uh, the head of the land use uh, department uh, in that uh, fairly large law firm. He's a past chair of the American Bar Association section on state and local government. He succeeded me a few, by a few years. Um, he's a past president of the American Planning Association. He's a, uh, a past chair of the American Institute of Certified Planners. Um, he's a fellow uh, in the American Institute of Certified Planners and also <clears throat> the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors. Um, he's um, also a fellow in the American College of Real Estate Lawyers. So he's got a lot of background, a lot of associations. He teaches at Vermont Law School in the land use planning uh, course and the University of Connecticut uh, Law School at Hartford. Um, I, I bet you the only downside is that he practices in Connecticut uh, where, where planning matters a lot less than it does here. <laughs> Um, he'll give you some, some thoughts on that. Um, without any further ado, I would uh, introduce to you Dwight Merriam. Thank you. Now, let's see if I can fire this computer up here. Because this won't be any good without pictures. It won't be any good with pictures either. <laughs> I'm just saying. Um, Ben, thanks for the, and thank you, Ed, for the invitation. Thanks to the uh, organizing committee. Um, you know, I, this is an honor and a privilege. I tried to think if there were other words I could use, but it is just that, an honor and a privilege. And for me, an opportunity to float an idea and get some feedback uh, with a fairly friendly audience of something that has troubled me for a very long time. Uh, with regard to the way we make decisions. Um, what also troubles me is this computer. I'm deeply troubled by this computer. Let's see what happened. I think we may have to go down and go up. Uh, the dean put the lid down. Let's see. Does anybody know any good tunes that they can hum at this moment? Um, they're going to have to go down and go up. So, you know, the, the thing that's funny about computers is you have to do, you have to start to stop. Dean closed the lid on me here. I think we may have to go down, huh? This is being video, so this poor cameraman back here. I'm over here. <laughs> hey, hey, over here. Hey. Oh, this, is back up with the this is a problem because they want to they, they want to get some decent audio in this, and as someone who spent 31 years in the Navy as a surface warfare officer, I don't need a microphone. <laughs> um, so while they're figuring this out, oh, there we go. This is let, me, let me start out by. Yeah. Is this good? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Now, do you have any questions? <laughs> well, you're applauding the AV guy. 
Ben, I'm going to answer Ben's question. Your question about, you know, does planning and law make sense coming together? I mean, that's, that's my career. I mean, I, I, I vote yes. I, I didn't know what I was going to do. I have four children and watch them go on up through and decide what they're going to be. How many of you in high school knew what you were going to be where you are today? See, most you did. Good. And uh, this is not the podiatrist meeting. This is the planning and law group. <laughs> You know, we don't know what we're going to do. I went off to college expecting to be a, a, a seventh grade math teacher. Really, that's what I was headed to be. I, somebody said after a couple of years, there's a, a course in planning I, in the landscape architecture school. And I said, well, you, you might be interested. And I said, well, what is that? And well, they told me what it was. And I went over and I took that semester course. And for me, what I found was that planning brought together for me my interest in quantitative methods and analysis and all of the scientific side of that. I was having a very animated conversation with somebody on the plane last night about vernal pools. Only a planter could have that conversation. And uh, maybe an ecologist. And at the other side, I was interested in the, the social aspects of, of helping people. And, and planning did that for me. So it wasn't until then I got my master's in planning later, and uh, af it was only after I finished my graduate degree in planning that I said, you know what, skills of a lawyer would be useful to what I would like to do as a planner. And so I went on to law school and got a law degree, worked for a couple of law firms over the summer, and discovered that I could do the work of a planner at the fees of a lawyer. <laughs> I have 100, 240 lawyers, and I've been doing it for 30, almost 35 years. And so for me, it's easy to say planning and law belong together. And uh, whether you end up on the planning side of that continuum or the law side or some combination, um, it is a, a wonderful place to be for all of us that are involved in it in various respects. All right, so let me start out. I'm, I, I'm a little tethered by this. Was that okay? You've got a headphones on. Was that okay when I walked around here? Are it's you good okay, with that? Yeah. Can I get out from behind this? Thanks. Woo! That's <laughs> such a relief. Let me just share at the outset a couple of stories. What I want to do is tell you what I see as a problem in our decision-making process, particularly about large projects with big public benefits, where there are neighbors who are hurt. And what's wrong with that process, and, and what I refer to as a modest proposal, then I went back and read Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, <laughs> and realized that maybe this is not the right way to go, but you can read about it in the, in the writing I left you. And I want, to, I want to talk to you about the problems that we have in that decision making based on my experience as a practitioner. I represent large scale developers about 60% of the time. And I represent governments and private property owners the other 40% of the time. I have consciously kept a mix of types of folks that I work with to try to stay as much down the middle as I, as I can. But I've definitely discovered some things that are clearly wrong with what we're doing. Here are two short stories. I'll start with you, Rob Thomas, in the back, um, who uh, is from Honolulu in California. He was a, what, a first year associate when you and I crossed paths. Uh, I was already been practicing for several years, 1984 maybe, 1983, city and county of Honolulu, asked me to come in and defend them in a case where they had rezoned some property, 107 acres in this particular case, at a place called Queens Beach, rezoned it from resort and medium density residential to, you ready for this classification? Preservation. The developer, which was Henry J. Uh, Henry Kaiser's corporation, had developed Hawaii Kai, and they had contemplated the 
the ultimate development of this 107 acres by having their road system, their water system, their sewer system, their whole development sized to accommodate this last piece. And so after they rezoned it to preservation is when they called us and we came in. I mean, we're in Hartford, Connecticut, and they said, we want you to go to Honolulu for a while. <laughs> I said, well, okay. <laughs> I mean, we had over 30 inches of snow last week, and Ed Sullivan says, you want to come to Portland? And, okay. <laughs> so we went out there, and, and Rob was on the other side, and uh, representing the property owner, and we were representing the city of County Honolulu. Here's the thing that just seems so odd in the end. In the United States, and I went and I tried to look where everybody is coming from that's here, and I went and started to look at all your different countries and started to do a comparative law thing, and then I said, I can't possibly do this. Uh, it's so different, all the systems around the world, and I hope we're going to have a conversation. My job, I thought I was the warm-up act. The dean turned out to be the warm-up act. I don't know, I'm the warmed-over act. And, and, but I want to start a dialogue and a conversation in a cross-cultural comparative law sense about what's going on around the world with regard to the issues that I'm going to talk about that I'm so familiar with in this country. But here it is, for the most part, if your property value is taken away by government decision-making, you might have a claim under the Constitution. We have 51 constitutions, one federal and 50 state. But if it's not a constitutionally protected property right, you're not going to have a claim. And what you and I may think is a property right, the law may not respect as a property right in the common law of constitutional protections. In this case, what happened was well, I wouldn't tell you the story if we didn't win. <laughs> Not only did we win, we had a jury trial. And the jury trial, we got a directed verdict after putting, after the plaintiff put on their case. They, the judge actually took it away from the jury, which is pretty much unheard of, because we only needed a minimal threshold test of showing that there was some minimal use left in the property, which there was. You could do a golf course very tight on 107 acres, and vacation cabins, one 700 square feet, one per acre, I think it was. But here was the big background issue that troubles me today, and I know it troubles Rob and others, is that under Hawaii state law, which is the law that's applied, the contract between the developer and the property owner, on which the developer had depended in designing and building and sizing the development in contemplation of developing this last key piece is not property. The contract is not property as a matter of state law and therefore is not protected, constitutionally protected property. And they were injured, would you not say, Rob? I would say so. A big number, a very large number. But again, did I mention? We won. <laughs> um, the other story is, is, I have people complain. I have people often complain to me, Dwight, how can you represent these people? Whoever it is, it doesn't matter, whether it's the government or the neighbors or the developer. And I say, you should see the ones I turned down. <laughs> And here's really a wonderful man that I turned down because I thought his case was not winnable, not winnable by any chance. So my partners and I talked about it. It's cited in my paper, which is a very preliminary draft, and I encourage you to send me emails and call me and uh, give me your feedback on it because I want to refine it and take it to another level later. And that's why I thank you particularly for this opportunity to to try this idea out on you. This man came to me. This was uh, uh, a few years after our Hawaii fun time that went on for what, about five years, I think. Right? <coughs> and um, the residential subdivider, divided up land, built houses, you know the type of worldwide sort of 
operation, but this was a local operation that he was doing. And at the same time, there was a state siting organization that cited facilities. And what they were citing, they were looking around the state. They had low-level radioactive waste, typically hospital waste from radiological things. You know what I'm talking about? you got to do something with that, right? You, you have to have a secure facility, but you don't need a high-level facility like a nuclear power plant. And you want to take care of it within the borders, in, in this country anyway, within the borders of your state. So they identified a whole bunch of sites as potential low-level radioactive waste sites. One of them happened to be next to this residential developer's recently proposed, approved, and ready-to-be-built residential subdivision. Did he have a constitutionally protected property right for which he could have a successful taking claim? Anybody? No. Was he injured? Yes. Did he get represented by another firm? Yes. Did they lose? Yes. There's something wrong with what happened there. What's wrong with what happened there? What should be different in what happened there? I'm going to give you a hypothetical in a little bit about a wind farm. But this person I was sitting next to on the plane, I tried I've given up talking to people next to me on the plane, but this one I happened to start talking to, and and uh, she and I told her, she said, "What are you going out here for?" And I just told her what I was coming out here for, and she said, "You should be talking about fracking." I said, "Everybody's talking about fracking," but she's right. I'm not talking about wind farms, but we should be thinking about gas and oil extraction, the impact on other people, and what a big deal it's become worldwide, and particularly in parts of the United States with a shale play like the Marcellus shale play from Ohio on up into the Northeast have been very controversial. There's something wrong with the way we're making these decisions. <coughs> There's got to be a better way to do it. Um, so let's, let's do talk about that. Anybody know who this is talking here? Hmm? He's defending himself, 1521, Martin Luther. That worms? And here's what he said. It matters whose ox is gore. I want to talk about those who benefit from our land use planning decision making and those who are burdened. It matters whose ox is gored and how we're going to remedy their injury. Oh, wait a second. Door prizes. <laughs> You're the only one who's laughing at. Um, <laughs> I've been there. Door prizes. You've been there, right? Door prizes. Yeah, I like to start these off with a little door prize thing, you know, I mean, it's a way to get people to, people, they have such worried looks on their faces. <laughs> um, all right, let's, do, let's start with this one. Um, many of you are world travelers, okay? How many of you are from countries outside the United States? All right. I think, however, there's only going to be one person who wins, can win this prize. Who has been to exactly 108 countries? Ed. Oh, Ed. Stand up, Ed. I guess he's the winner. Now, Ed told me earlier you could have too many tote bags. But I, you can't have too many Ed Sullivan, I've been to 108. Ed Sullivan. I had to spell check that. I mean, how many times do you write peripatetic? <laughs> All right, now here's the one. All you Oregon people, you're out of this contest, okay? I, I, everybody take your hands off your smartphones. Now, I'm wondering if any Wikipedia answers here. And whoever comes closest, the pe three people come closest, will get a copy of one of the books I've written. This is a book that is so bad that my partner said I couldn't give it away. <laughs> I'm here to prove them wrong. I'm going to give it away. 
And it's a book that will be totally useless to a whole lot of you because it's about zoning. But it tells a lot of stories about the battles we've been through. So here's a little hint. Portland's 145 square miles, 376 square kilometers. So you get an idea. What's the population? Of course, it's not a very dense city compared to cities overseas. So get a number down. You can't, if you don't have a number either in your head or written down, you can't play. All right, you have to have a number. And um, here's the book. McGraw-Hill picked the title, The Complete Guide to Zoning. It didn't say like the half-baked guide to zoning or something. <laughs> And it's not even a half-baked guide, but you know, it's McGraw-Hill for heaven's sake. So, um, anyway, got a number? Everybody got a number that wants to play? All right, somebody shout out a number. 550. 550. Now remember, the Oregon people are disqualified, all right? The people that have their hands on their smartphones wrestle those smartphones away from them. 600. All right, who thinks he's who thinks they're closest? I think. Yeah. Okay, who's next closest? 595. You get ethics credit for this too. Did you just write that number down on this slide? No. Did you keep an eye on him? Who else? Um, you don't, we don't do that. Don't go I don't know. Well, you're in the United States now, for having said it, buddy. Just for tennis, New Jersey. <laughs> Now, I know I'm going to see a wave of those for sale on eBay tomorrow. So here's the problem. Or check the airport lounges. Check the airport lounges. <laughs> I'll autograph them if you want, but it'll just decrease the value more. They're now your solid waste problem. Take them home. We're exporting our trash overseas. So here's the problem, right? Is this not what I said? I mean, I think this is our problem. And here is the hypothetical I want you to think about while I tell you a few more things. This is a sort of made-up thing from several different examples. Wind Energy for All is the company, Wind Energy Incorporated. It's a big facility, $50 million is going to cost. They're going to build it, 24 megawatts, 16 turbines. Some of you here is from Croatia. I've just been reading about Croatia's wind farm development, kind of interesting. Um, similar to some of the facilities they have there on uh, 1,000 acres, they're almost 7,000 square meters. They're the standard sort of GE issue, 1.5 megawatt turbines. And here is the um, uh, uh, drawing or a sketch, if you will, of uh, what they would look like along this ridge top. This ridge top is the best area within 100 miles, 150 kilometers of this site. There's no other place that's better for wind power than right here where they want to do it. There are two neighbors. One of them is a place called the Hermit's Castle. You read this whole story. I mean, I just made this up for heaven's sakes. But this man built this eccentric Gothic castle for his young wife who died almost shortly after they were married, became a, a, a complete hermit, lived in this house, fell into disrepair, went through several hands, was abandoned, eventually bought, and turned into a very upscale bed and breakfast and spa. And guess what it's right next to? The proposed wind farm. It's right down here, overlooking this ridge top. Also, at sort of the other end of the continuum of all the houses that are around, besides the Hermit's Castle, there's this house. There's the couple down there. They paid only a couple hundred thousand dollars for this old farm uh, before our big recession here in this country. And they, they owe more than th on it than it's worth. And they're affected by the wind farm, as you'll see, but only in a little bit, but in a way that's a big impact for them. And here's the decision maker, the Public Utilities Commission. Happens to be a state commission. Could be a national, could be a local. They're going to make the decision. Here are the benefits. The multiplier effects of the long-term production of the sustainable energy, the construction jobs, the maintenance, everything that goes with it, at least a couple hundred million dollars. Decreased fossil fuel use, big benefit. 
better air quality, at least 8,000 homes can be serviced by this facility. But all the ratepayers benefit in some way. But look at the burdens. The Hermit's Castle, it's the only graphic I can find with vacancy on, it's kind of funny if you, if you know the movie. That's what's going to happen to the poor Hermit's Castle. People aren't going to go there. They're trying to go to an upscale away place, and now they're going to be overlooking a wind farm, and they're going to lose a million dollars in value. They're still going to be worth at least a million, but they're going to lose half their value because of the wind farm. The old farmhouse, they're only losing $20,000 in value. At least that's what they claim by being in close proximity to the wind farm. But for that couple that put that sweat equity to fix that old building up, they're ruined. So this is the, the people that are coming to argue against the wind farm. How does the Public Utility Commission decide this case? In the United States, the principal way we decide siting issues is under the police power. The police power is a power fundamental to the states in the United States. It's the power to protect, promote, preserve the public health, the public safety, and the public's general welfare. The public's health, the public safety, the public's general welfare. Not just the Hermit's Castle, not just the young couple with all the sweat equity in their old house. Although that is considered. The police power in this country is, Ed and others will tell you who teach the course, I used to say morals in there in the middle. In fact, we even used the police power to regulate away billboards by saying immoral things could happen behind them um, because we didn't have the strength to say that aesthetics alone could be a purpose of land use regulation. But morals fell out of the formula somewhere 50 years ago. One of the fundamental problems we have in law in the United States and the law in other countries, I was looking at, if somebody is here from Kenya, if they're in the room here right now, oh, and I was reading about one of your cases that I have here in my materials, which is a, a nuisance case, and it's the same sort of bright line rules, although you have some compensation possibilities, but bright line rules um, that we have in our country that we found very difficult. And I, I looked at nuisance and trespass in several other countries represented here today, and I see generally the same thing, but it's a little different. But here's one of our problems. Our problem in this country is in the common law, in, in, in Western Anglo-Saxon law in the United States too, is this bright line rules. Here's one of them. And, and here's, here's the point of this, which I'll get to in a moment. Let me just jump ahead so, so you'll understand why I'm telling you about this at this juncture. Is that when it comes to property, and it's not just property rights, it's interests which are economically and adversely affected by our land use decisions, which may or may not be property rights as such, but for the most part, they're encompassed by the term property rights. Our courts do not like hard and fast rules on property rights. They want the flexibility to come to what the courts believe are more equitable solutions. And our law has moved towards that in several respects. And our U.S. Supreme Court, in a couple of cases that they have this term, have been very, has been very clear that they want to have broad discretion, but it's so ad hoc we don't have rules which is a problem. So here's one, nonfeasance versus misfeasance or malfeasance. And, and I'll give you an example of a dramatic case that's in my paper of somebody who set up a situation where he taunted his buddy to jump into a, a pool and the buddy jumped in and he just stood there. And his friend drowned. And his friend's widow sued and said, you didn't try to rescue him. And the court says, there's no liability for nonfeasance. If you don't try to do something, you're never going to be liable. Once you start something, you could be guilty of malfeasance or misfeasance. A very sharp, bright line with a disturbing and untenable and generally unacceptable result. We, that's why we have good Samaritan laws. That's why we want people to rescue. But yet we have this sharp line, a bright line, in this area of the common law. Same with nuisance. If it's a nuisance, what happens? What's the typical remedy in a nuisance case? Whether it's public or private nuisance. What's the remedy? You just, an injunction of relief. If it's a nuisance, they're done. If it's not a nuisance, go to it. Am I right? And this is the way it is across many different countries. 
This is one of my favorite cases. How many, just by way of reference, so I know how far I have to go, how many have ever heard of this case, Spur against Del Webb? Excellent. Great case. Because it shows you how uncomfortable we are with these bright line rules. Why we don't like them. Why we got to break out of this box. Spur Industries is a feedlot. You know what a feedlot is? Yeah, you know what a feedlot is. It's not pretty. Del Webb builds Sun City. You know what Sun City is? Sun City is age restricted. A lot of people on big tricycles riding around and stuff, right? <laughs> no kids. All right? So here's what happened outside of Phoenix. The feedlot's been there for a long time and it's growing and growing. And Del Webb comes in, and it's growing, and it's growing at Sun City, Sun, uh, the, uh, Sun City communities. And here's Del Webb's neighbor. You can't see what all those little dots are. Those little dots are cattle heads. Tens of thousands of cattle being fed. Millions of pounds of manure generated every day. And all those ugly statistics are laid out in horrible detail in my paper for you. So what is the doctrine with nuisance that applies in this case where the feedlot is there, along comes Sun City and Del Webb and builds and builds right up to it. What do you call it? Coming to the nuisance. And what's the typical result? You don't, you don't, you don't get the injunction. You know, Del Webb, you came in there, you built Sun City, you grew up to the feedlot. Well, of course, the feedlot's growing too. Um, but the court said, that's not working here. That's not right. That's, what's happening in Sun City is, is, the, is the development of today and, and where our communities are going, not in feedlots. So I'm going to set aside the coming to the nuisance defense, given the fact that the feedlot grew, but Sun City was grow, growing too. And I'm going to say to you, um, the uh, feedlot, you're going to go out of business or move. But the court said, Sun City, you got to pay. That's the fashion, equitable, sort of ad hoc, break the bright line rule solution. The feedlot has to go, but Sun City, you can stay, but you're going to have to pay for the cost of the relocation or the loss to the feedlot operator. Another one of my favorite cases. How many has ever heard this case? Boomer against Atlantic Cement. Got to love this case, right? C classic nuisance trespass. And that's the other thing. Th this is, in our law, there's a strange admixture, as there is in other countries, as I found in looking around the, several of the countries represented here, this admixture of trespass and nuisance, which is all tied up with our own takings law in this country. But this is a, more or less a trespass case. And what happens when there's trespass? Bright line rule, either or, winner take all. So if it's a trespass, what do you get? Injunctive relief, can get damages too, um, as you can get in the nuisance. But you get injunctive relief, you got to stop the trespass, get out of there. This is New York. Atlantic cement, this is not concrete, this is cement, this is the dust that goes with sand and gravel and water to make concrete. It's a state-of-the-art plant. It's the best they can do. They don't know how to make cement in any better way without the adverse impacts it's having on its neighbors. And there's noise, vibration, and cement dust. And the neighbors start an action, they end up in court. What's the court going to do with this bright line rule? Well, they fashioned the solution too. Again, setting aside the bright line rules that happen, they pulled a rabbit out of the hat. You don't know how long I had to try to think, how am I ever going to represent the solution with some graphic, but the rabbit they pulled out of the hat here was that, yes, you're going to stop the trespass, you're going to shut down your cement plant, but only if, and here's the key to where I want to go, but only if, you don't pay the neighbors for the easement to put the dust on their property. Instead of the draconian either or winner take all result of a typical trespass action, shut down and get out, or continue to operate unabated 
with no remedy for the neighbors if it's not a trespass. Maybe the dust is so minimal, maybe the vibration is something you just have to live with as a property owner, which is where a court would end up in a takings claim by finding no taking. Instead of doing that, it says to the cement company, go make your peace with the neighbors. Pay them something for the dust that you're putting on the property. Because you, the cement company, provide an important public benefit. We want you to continue to operate. But you have to compensate those who are burdened. Now here's the U.S. Supreme Court's docket this year. Three takings cases, the first time since 2005. Arkansas Game and Fish Commission. It was a flooding case. Way up here in Clearwater Lake. Again, let me just do a reality check. How many of you have happened to have read this decision or read about it? Okay, just a few of you. Well, good. <coughs> Why I'm going to tell you about these two cases is because there are actually three cases. The third one is about, I'm not going to talk about it. I didn't even write about it, the article. It's called Horn, and it's about what I call it, Rob, raisin sequestration. It's a price control case. They're making the raisin growers, which are mostly all in California, you know. When the, when the prices plummet, they take the raisins away and hide them out. <clears throat> and then they even give away to the kids at school uh, or sell them for cheap later, but they're doing it to support the market. It goes back to the Depression. That case hasn't been argued yet. Are the briefs in, Rob? Most of the briefs are in. Rob's, Rob Thomas, incidentally, has a great website called inversecondemnation.com, uh, which will keep you up on a daily basis with what's going on in the world of uh, takings law, for the most part, in this country. Um, and uh, so I'm not going to talk about that, but the other two cases are really important to understanding how conflicted our courts are, how we are not come to grips with, with how we're going to treat this relationship between the needs of planning and the benefits for the public, while we're still respecting the rights and interests of property owners and others who are burdened by our decision making. So in this case, up in Missouri, they built a dam over 100 miles away there's the Clearwater Dam that the Corps of Engineers built 60 years ago. And here it is during the construction phases. And they did this for flood control, and they did it to help enhance uh, the habitat downstream so they could control the water going in, which would support bird, waterfowl particularly. And also there's some farming in between. There's B down the bottom is the uh, wildlife management area, which sued for a taking. And A up at the top is the dam. So here's, here's, the, here's the short story version of this. They had a, a plan by which they would open and close the dam to let water go down. And they, they made the plan around 1950 after they spent three years studying it. And then about 15, 12, 13 years ago, no more than that, 94 to 2000, right? Um, 1994. The Corps of Engineers, and, and they, they have these releases of water. And the releases were great because they would help the waterfowl, and then the hunters could go out and shoot them all. So that was a great public benefit, to be able to go out and shoot as many ducks as you wanted to shoot. And um, there were farmers in between who were farming, and the way they controlled the water allowed the farmers to do some crop planting and harvesting. And... Um, down there in the wildlife management area, um, really? <laughs> um, is it 10:15? Did you do 10:14? Do I have till 10:30 or do I have to 10:15? <laughs> well, I'm going to skip the story unless you want me to tell the story. <laughs> I'm very mindful of time. I really, very uncomfortable. With, with, uh, we'll end on time. Don't worry about it. Um, so the farmers were happy enough, and the wildlife management area was happy enough. The ducks were kind of unhappy in the end. But, um, but the other thing that was going on down the wildlife management area, they had bottomland oak trees. And those oak trees are perfectly fine when they get flooded in the winter when they're dormant. As long as the flooding is intermittent.
But if you flood them in the summer and you keep water on their roots, it kills them. Now, the farmers, I think, I can't be sure because I, I, I tried to get behind this to find out exactly what happened, but I got a pretty good idea that the farmer lobby was strong enough <coughs> that it convinced the Corps of Engineers to change their schedule for a while. They had the right under their plan to divert from the schedule of water releases, but they started releasing less water at certain times so the farmers could farm more and make some more money. And the water built up behind the dam, and then they would release larger, uh, uh, release water over a longer period of time. They actually released larger slugs of water earlier. They would go on down through and be gone. Now to protect the farmers and give the farmers more time to plant and harvest, they were releasing water over a longer period that went on into the growing season for the oaks. And guess what happened? Killed them. And the Arkansas Game and Fish Commission, which owns the management area, said, That's, you're taking my trees. And they sued. And they got up to the United States Supreme Court. And the United States Supreme Court said, in a unanimous decision, that regarding the loss of these trees, this happens to be one of the bottom of the oak trees, that you probably, you probably have, um, you have a possible taking for the loss of your trees. The problem was the court, it came up as a physical type of taking case, and these are the three types that we have in the United States. Physical invasion, which is a per se taking, sort of an automatic taking. I tell my students it's just a write a check taking. You're not going to talk anymore about it. The government physically and permanently invades your property, they're just going to have to write a check. Mrs. Loretto, all she got was a shoebox size, and there's her apartment building in that little picture, a shoebox size cable box on her apartment that actually benefited her tenants because now they could get cable in New York City. But she sued for a taking and, and won. I think she got $100. I mean, that's really all it was. Um, but it was a physical invasion taking, and it's just write a check. So when you flood somebody's property, doesn't that sound like a physical invasion taking and when you kill off their trees? And that's the way the case went up and went in, was, was presented at first. But water is a weird thing because water is not like a shoebox-sized cable box. First of all, it wasn't there permanently. It was there for several years when they <laughs> deviated from the control plan. And the other thing is water goes away after a while, right? So we don't really don't know what to do with water when it comes to takings. You know what? I don't care. Somebody was injured. The wildlife management area was injured. I don't care whether it's, it, it, it's constitutionally protected property or not. The question is, how do we compensate them for them? The other type of per se taking is this Lucas categorical taking. That's Lucas's lots there in the little picture. You hardly ever see these. I may have seen one, maybe, since night, uh, June 30, 1992, when that decision was decided. It was handed down by the court. And that's a case where the government regulates to the point where everybody agrees there's no use left. Well, how often does that happen? It doesn't. Anybody with half a brain can regulate around that to leave some use. So nearly all our takings are this Penn Central kind, which is this three-part test. How much, how much did you lose? Did you have a big loss in value? Not only that, did you have reasonable investment-backed expectations? Did you, was it reasonable what you were doing? Uh, and did you invest in it? And third, how do we balance the public's interest in what we're doing against the private loss? And that's the way Arkansas fishing game is going back on remand to the lower courts in this unanimous U.S. Supreme Court decision. They're saying it's not a physical invasion per se taking. You're going to have to go wrestle with these three part Penn Central tests, which is very difficult for a property owner to, 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 to do. And the lower federal court, when they issued an order, I guess it was a couple of weeks ago, 10 days ago, they issued an order regarding the remand, and the last sentence of the order was, why don't you all just mediate this? <laughs> <laughs> the federal circuit does not want to have to decide the unanswered issues in this case of foreseeability, investment back, that sort of things, the whole thing that's out there in this ad hoc approach. And look what the court says in its unanimous judgment. Sure, it's a unanimous judgment that you might have a taking claim, 
But the, here's the court's decision. We've recognized that there's no magic formula. And then at the end, the court has recognized few and variable rules. The other case, and you can read about it in more detail in the paper, is the St. John's River Management District. Um, here you had a gentleman who, in this water district area in Florida, wanted to develop this parcel, 3.7 acres. He had to three, fill 3.4 of the acres as wetlands. Just that little lower right-hand corner, it says upland delineation. That's the only part that's upland. The rest of it's wetlands. So he had to go to the water district for a permit. He went to the water district and says, I want to fill this. This case has been going on so long, the man has died. It's now his estate that's prosecuting the case. And there it is from the aerial St. Parcel. You see the parcel shape? All right. So they said, well, you've got to mitigate the loss. He says, okay, I'll give you the rest of the 11 acres that I own. The other 11 acres in addition to the 3.7 I want to develop. They said, okay, Koi Kuhn Sr. is his name, the late Koi Kuhn Sr. Uh, Jr. is now <coughs> prosecuting the case for his estate. Okay, we'll take the 11 acres, but we want you to do mitigation elsewhere in this habitat area, which has no habitat value left anyway, because it's all, look at it, it's commercially developed for the most part. And here's a, here's a line drawing. That black line drawing is from his site at the bottom. The end of that drawing is where the mitigation area is, four and a half to seven miles away. We want you, Koi Kuhn Sr., to go up there and to put in some new drainage pipes and to close off some drainage swales and do some other mitigation work to enhance the habitat in this area if we're going to give you a permit to fill your wetlands below. And Koi Kuhn says, I'm not doing that. I'm not doing that. Give me my permit. And he sued. And while his suit was making his way up through, they capitulated. They said, okay, take your permit. He continued to pursue it. Does he have a taking? Do we compensate him for the many years of delay that he suffered because the government wouldn't give him a permit because he refused to um, undertake mitigation at a far distant site? And now here's the thing that shows you how starkly conflicted the court is. A month before this oral argument, they had decided Arkansas Fish and Game unanimously saying, you probably got to take him. Go wrestle with it on remand. In this case, an oral argument, and they haven't decided, even Justice Scalia, who is generally a supporter of property rights, said, nothing happened here. I mean, he just he refused to do the, didn't get a permit. And at the end, I can't see where there's a taking here. Nothing's been taken. Justice Sotomayor says, why are we even in this case? I mean, this is a total eclipse of the sun. They went from night to day in a month's time. They went from a unanimous decision finding that, that even if it was just flooding and it was temporary, you still could be compensated under certain conditions, to... Koi Kuhn Sr. refused to do this way off-site exactions for which there was no connection or nexus, but we can't possibly find that this could be a taking because of all the problems it will cause. Our court doesn't want any hard or fast rules, and the result is one of chaos and ad hocery. So here's my idea. Separate the decision-making process, like for the wind farm, from the compensation side. From, from, and, and we've got examples of it here, too, already in this country. And I'll bet you have them in your countries, those from overseas, that can share in the time we have left and later on in the next three days. Leaking underground storage tanks for gasoline. It's important we have gasoline stations. And more often than not, when a tank fails, it's not because the operator was incompetent or negligent. They just fail sometimes. So we take a fraction of a penny off of every gallon sold nationally. And other states, Georgia and Connecticut among them, have their own similar programs. Your tank fails, you don't have the money, it doesn't matter whether you have the money or not in some cases, they're going to fix your tank for you. Who, who benefits? Who benefits by that? The motoring public, the people that need gasoline. We don't want the gasoline station owner and operator to be burdened by a catastrophic failure that's beyond his or her control. And so we spread the burden among all who are benefited. National Vaccine Injury Compensation Program. You've all read about the controversy over vaccines. Some people think it causes various developmental disabilities and, and, the, and otherwise. 
The pharmaceutical companies are concerned about getting sued for their vaccines. We want them to produce vaccines. It's a public benefit. We want, as a society, for people to be vaccinated, to prevent the spread of disease, right? You may disagree personally or individually with vaccines in certain cases, but for the most part, that's what society wants. So what do we do? Every dose, when you get that DPT shot, diphtheria, what's the other, tetanus, what's the P? Pertussis. Yeah, what's that? isn't it DPT? Pertussis. 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 Thank you, thank you. Um, each one of the, they, that single shot is three doses. I think it's 25 cents a dose set aside. And it comes out of you who pay for the vaccine and out of the pharmaceutical companies who make it. And it goes into this fund. If, if somebody's vaccinated and they get sick and they believe they have a claim, they don't sue the pharmaceutical company. They go to the trust fund to get compensated. Radiation Exposure Compensation Act Trust Fund. We did a whole lot of nuclear atmospheric testing. A whole lot of people were exposed and I'm very ill as a result. We all benefited, if I can use that term, from the testing at the time it was done, at least we thought we did. And we, as a society in the United States, owe those people who were injured. And we all chip in to pay through it for our taxes in this trust fund. So for the wind farm, I just made this up. I'm just making all of this up. Um, uh, and I'm trying to, I'm sure somebody's thought about this before, and I just haven't found the article, so help me here. So maybe we start, and I'm talking about large developments. In Florida, we have developments of regional impact. Maybe it's large projects only. Maybe it's projects with a particular public benefit. I don't know where that line is. But for, for people like Eric Santini and the low-level radioactive waste site, this is what I wanted to do. But I couldn't even propose it to him or to the government at the time. It just was not going to be acceptable. Sustainable Energy Compensation Trust Fund. The ratepayers pay part of it. The governments pay part of it. The wind energy company pays part of it. And, and the benefited citizens. And so the people that own the Hermit's Castle and that young couple that fixed up that farmhouse, when the Public Utility Commission is deciding whether that wind farm should go on that ridge top, it's going to look at the pub public's health, safety, and general welfare issues only. And it's going to say to the Hermit's Castle and to the couple on the farm, go to the Sustainable Energy Compensation Board and make your case for compensation. There's going to be adequate funding. We need $2 million to fund those neighbors, a million for the Hermit's Castle, 20000 for the couple, another couple of million for the rest of the people. And the answer is why not? So questions or comments in the three or four minutes we have left, and we've got a dialogue going on in the next couple of days. What, what's wrong with this idea? Well, first of all, everybody tell me what's right with this idea. <laughs> somebody tell me what's wrong with this idea, or somebody tell me if you have similar compensation programs that separate the land use decision-making process from helping people who are burdened that shouldn't be when we're doing good things for society generally in land development. Anybody? Yeah. So if I'm an energy developer and I know that there's a compensation fund, what's to slow me down from just going ahead and uh, doing all kinds of things that I wouldn't do if I had to pay for it? Because what's to slow them down if, oh, if you didn't have to pay for it? Uh -huh. If I had to pay for it, then I, I would act differently than if you're, you and your funder paying for it. Well, the, you're right, but the, 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 remember, I've been reading some things about why takings, decision making should be different if the government's causing the taking or if the government is allowing a private party to cause the taking. And the, part of the answer is that we cannot any longer draw a line between private action and government action, all the public-private partnerships, all the government-induced private efforts. Um, really, in this concept, the ratepayers principally would pay, everybody who pays for energy. And you see I spell out how those economics would work. I think the decision-making for the wind farm developer or shale play developer isn't going to be any different because they're going to be subject to the same public review on 
health, safety, general welfare grounds. Comments, questions, yeah. Go ahead, it sounds like a variation of both the uh, windfalls you pay for life. life yes, yeah, Donald Hagman's book. And yeah. uh, the problem is a political problem. In the politics, local or national, you have winners and losers. Simple, influential people get development uh, permits and it has their property values. If they are required to pay for the people whose property rights they diminish, they don't like that. Uh, and, you know, in extreme cases, it would require every football match to end in a tie, if, you know, for the winner to give points to the loser so it would be more fair. Uh, so the biggest problem is the political lot because the winners are more uh, influential than the, the losers. Right. And you, you buy good lawyers, mm -hmm. and you go, one of my proceedings went 27 nights. And uh, you buy good lawyers, and you bang, bang, bang on it. And in my paper, I talk about the potlatch Indians and, you know, the, the war of attrition. And, yeah, there were some people that want that, but most developments don't cause much in off-site impacts. And if the off-site impact burden can be spread around a large population. We'll take one more last question and comment. Yep. What about New London, where the plan is <laughs> <laughs> development? Um, does that feel it was a tough Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, ideologically. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The question is, what about New London? You know, our time is up, but I appreciate all of the really good questions that come here. I have had a total immersion experience in New London. I, I, I have New London PTSD, I think. Um, the, we represented Pfizer early on in that case, uh, which was quickly taken out of the case as not really being relevant to the decision making that went on. I did a book in 2006 called Eminent Domain Use and Abuse, Kilo in Context. Kilo is, is not the type of case I'm talking about. And the reason why Kilo is, Kilo, Kilo is, the problem, with, the problem with Kilo is our doctrine that says, if the government thinks it's going to work, whether there's any proof that it does or not, that's good enough for the courts. We look back with the vision of hindsight, it didn't work in Kilo, and they should have been more suspect of the government's plan. But it's not this case because it's, it's not an inverse case that's a direct condemnation eminent domain case in which presumably just compensation is paid to those who lose their property. The principal issue with Kilo, as I see it, is, is the uncompensated loss to the owners, people who were pushed out of their houses that had lived there for 100 years, three generations. So thank you for your attention. I'll be here for the, all three days. Please buttonhole me and help me keep me from embarrassing myself by publishing something that absolutely is wrong or can't work has been already invented. Uh, otherwise, I'm going to take this to another draft and, and put it out there. Thank you very much for your time.